All right, good evening, uh, beautiful people, man. Thanks so much for uh, joining us here tonight. Uh, we're just uh, uh, going live here on the New Black Wall Street Book Club, uh, allowing Facebook. We'll be uh, streaming live tonight, uh, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Instagram Live. So give us just a few seconds uh, to just let everybody know that we're here. Uh, when you guys get connected, man, if you are enjoying um, what we're doing here, uh, in order for you to be informed of when we go live, which we look to do uh, daily at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Make sure you go ahead and hit the like button or follow button. Uh, hit the notification button let, so that you don't know when we go live so that you can get, uh, you know, you can be a part of our show. You can be a part of the platform. Uh, but other than that, uh, you can find us on ERGJ Enterprise across all platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and whichever one of those uh, platforms uh, you prefer best, that's where you can find us at as well, okay? So it's New Black Wall Street Book Club where black folk do read. And uh, we'll be uh, picking up Black Fortunes, uh, which is the uh, story of the first six African-Americans who escaped slavery and became millionaires. So we're getting into chapter one. That's going to be the meat of what we discussed today. And we also do have our um, motivation for today, our daily motivation for African-American success. Ray, Ray, hit the like button, hit the share button, let people know that we're here, uh, that you're connected to. And it's time to get this show on the road. Uh, you know what time it is, man. Mr. DJ, hit the music. New, new black Wall Street book club. Evan Jefferson, brother, much love. Educating, elevating, because in knowledge is the power and we'll never give it up. <laughs> Living children's for the masses. Where to put your money down, now how to watch your assets. Yeah, uplifting others is a passion. My brother Evan, he will turn it into action. New black Wall Street book club. You should come read with come us. us. Yeah, we comprehend and discuss. Yeah. We all just come together, there's no limit for there's us. No limit for us. <laughs> Here comes your host, New Black Wall Street. Evan, take it away. New Black Wall Street, <laughs> New Black Wall Street Book Club. Hey, grand evening to you, kings and queens. Thanks so much for joining us here tonight on the New Black Wall Street Book Club, where black folk do read. If you put it in a book, we absolutely will find it. I'm your host, ERGJ, your certified financial educator, CEO of ERGJ Enterprises, ERGJ Black Bazaar, and international best-selling author of the book, uh, The Black Billionaires Club. That book that I wrote is a study of black wealth. It's also a study of the 12 richest black people in the world today and how they built their wealth. And I just truly believe that if you want to be wealthy, that's a big if, by the way, I recommend that you study wealthy people. Well, you can begin that study by picking up the book and going to the website, www.dblackbillionairesclub.com, www.dblackbillionairesclub.com. You'll find that link in the description above or below. Well, tonight, beautiful people, we are going to continue along in our journey into our new book for our book club, which is called Black Fortunes. That's right. Black Fortunes. Everybody put in the comments, though, Fortune. Black Fortunes. It's the story of the first six African-Americans who escaped slavery and became millionaires. Okay? It's the story of the first six African-Americans who escaped slavery and became millionaires. Now, I think this book is right on point, right on time. Because there's still some African Americans who are, who are looking to escape slavery, whatever form of slavery that they consider themselves to be in, whether that be a financial slavery, or knee deep in debt, uh, whether that be emotional slavery, or uh, whether that be uh, uh, you know any other type of slavery that's out there, mental slavery. I think there's still some of us who are trying to escape slavery today and to get into the land flowing with milk and honey, which we would consider to be prosperity. And so I think we can learn something from our history. Our brothers and sisters who are just like us who had tougher times than we did. And here's the thing, guys. If they can do it, we can do it. If they did it back 100 years ago, 150 years ago, if they did it back then, when it was more difficult, then we can do it today. Everybody put in the comments, so if they can do it, I can do it. And so we'll be we continuing along in our journey into this and we get into abolition, abolition and, and capitalism. I want to say shout out to our sponsor here tonight, which is ERGJ Black Bazaar. Which is the Afrocentric uh, uh, Afrocentric market uh, Afrocentric marketplace, uh, where you can find Afrocentric home decor, black art inspired gifts, and then also uh, 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 personal natural personal care products. And their feature here tonight is going to be uh, their the small it's a mini messenger bag that they picked up. Uh, so you can pick up something like this for your, the youth. It's a mini messenger bag. It's a cross body bag. We consider this to be the new fanny pack. So make sure you check out the website at www.ergjblackbazaar.com, www.ergjblackbazaar.com. You'll find that link in the description above or below. Well, we're going to begin tonight with our appetizer. That's right. That's our, our affirmation appetizer. 
coming out of book, Daily Motivations for African-American Success by Mr. Dennis P. Kimbrough. Daily Motivations for African-American Success by Mr. Dennis P. Kimbrough. And our title for tonight is One Moment, Please. One Moment, Please. And here's our quote of the day. It comes from Dempsey Travis, who is an entrepreneur. And he says this, and I quote, Great opportunities come to those who make the most of small ones. Great opportunities come to those who make the most of small ones. Are you making the most of your small opportunities and being prepared for the great ones to come? And here's our passage of the day. Here's some meat of our motivation for today. Let's get it. Once a famous artist was hired to put stained glass windows into a cathedral, his eager young apprentice pleaded for the chance to design just one window. The master artist feared that an experiment on even a small window would prove costly, but his persistent apprentice kept up his pleas. Finally, the master agreed that he could try his hand on one window if he furnished his own materials and worked on his own time. The enterprising apprentice began gathering bits of glass that his master had discarded and set to work. In short order, the church was finished. When the cathedral doors were open, parishioners stood in awe before the apprentice's stained glass window, praising its beauty. Our lives are like this. If we take time to gather together the moments and opportunities we too often discard and waste, we find we can shape them into something of value and beauty. Now read that again. Our lives are like this. If we take the time to gather together the moments and opportunities we too often discard and waste, we find we can shape them. Everybody put it on so shape. We find that we can shape them into something of value and beauty. One moment. Please, good evening to you. And here's our affirmation of the day. Here's what you want to allow to take root into your subconscious, your heart, and you can grow and develop this thing by repeating it over and over and over again until it brings forth a harvest into your life. Repeat after me. Today, I will take a look at the moments I waste. What can I make of these moments? Again, repeat after me. Today, I will take a long look at the moments I waste. What can I make of these moments? What could you make of the moments that you waste? Let's do it again, people. Let's do it this time for the people in the back, the people in the way back. I want to make sure that they know that we're serious about this thing. Let's Repeat it again, and this time, let's say it with some conviction. Repeat after me. Today, I will take a long look at the moments I waste. What can I make of these moments? What can I make of these moments? One moment, please. Daily affirmations for African-American success. Daily affirmations for African-American success. Well, my beautiful people, that was our appetizer, our affirmation appetizer of the night of today's episode. And we want to get into the meat of our discussion tonight. And so we're going to be picking up into Black Fortunes. And we're into, uh, I think, chapter number one, which is uh, called Abolitionism and Capitalism. Now, uh, we went through the uh, last episode. We went through the back cover, the front cover. And we also, uh, let me hit that. New, okay, there we go. And we also, uh, back cover, front cover. And then we also went through the introduction and the prologue as we learned about the first black millionaire. 
And so today we're getting to abolitionism. And this is a, has a sm subtitle of August 12th of 1841. I just want you to think about just for, that just for a second. 1841. That in Nantucket. Uh, so we're going to, we should be able to finish the whole first chapter. So let's just call this part one of chapter one. Let's get it. The sun was warm and the air smelled of the salt water of the sandy coast of Nantucket on August 12th of 1841. On a dirt road lined with trees and hedges in a library known as the Nantucket Athenaeum, the town's first abolitionist convention came to order. 500 men and women took their seats, most of them local quackers. The men in plain dark colored suits with broad hats, the women in gray or brown dresses with bonnets. The Athenaeum had once been a church and retained an exterior of white wood and stone with stained glass windows and two stone columns at its entrance. Inside was a great room filled with benches of carved wood and bookshelves and oil paintings on the wall. From a platform in the back, William C. Coffin, a local abolitionist, made an announcement. There was a figurative slave in attendance and he was going to give a speech. Head swiveled as Frederick Douglass stood and made his way towards the stage. He was tall with a muscular frame that showed through his shirt and vest, a square jaw and a clean shaven face his hair coiled dark and parted and pushed across his forehead and down towards his ears. As he moved to the front of the room, members of the audience could see that he was shaking from stage fright. Douglas, who was 23 years old, had escaped from slavery in Maryland three years earlier. He now lived in New Bedford, Massachusetts and worked at a brass foundry. He was a preacher at the African, -Amer at the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in his town but had never spoken to an audience of more than a few dozen, nor had he much experience speaking in front of white people. Douglas had come to Nantucket for a working vacation, hoping to stay abreast of the, of the goings on in the abolitionist struggle, but more to relax on the island, looking out on the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I think this might be a good time, guys, because we're talking about abolitionism. Maybe one of you guys could take a moment to look up that word abolitionist. Give us the definition here on our stream because I want to make sure I'm, I'm, a, I'm understanding what an abolitionist is. Okay, so do me a favor and do that. That's somebody's a quick little homework. Hit that Google real quick. So needing a day or two of rest. What's going on, Miss uh, Female House Hustler? Thanks so much for joining. Needing a day or two of rest, I attended this convention, never supposing that I should take part in the proceedings, he recalled. Until now, I had taken no holiday since my escape from slavery. When Coffin asked him to come to the stage, he was so overcome with fear that he could barely keep his feet underneath him. As he took the stage, he felt ill. He summoned all his willpower to keep his back straight and his limbs steady. And then he began. His voice trembled as he spoke of being born and raised on a slave plantation in Maryland. He stuttered as he described in doing backbreaking labor and brutality at the hands of overseers. The audience hung on his every word. One of the attendees recalled, flinty hearts were pierced and cold ones melted by his eloquence. Our best pleaders for the slave held their breath for free and uh, for free of interrupting him. When Douglas finished, the well-known abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, a slim man with thinning hair, leaped onto center stage. He praised Douglas and sermonized of the evils of slavery, whipping the crowd into a fury. Have we been listening to a thing, a piece of property, or a man? He demanded motioning toward Douglas. A man, the audience cried back in unison. A man. Shall such a man be held a slave in a Christian land, Garrison demanded. No, no, the audience shouted back, seeming to make the rafters shake. Douglas himself, moved by Garrison, recalled for a moment a public meeting is transformed, as it were, into a single individuality, the orator wielding a thousand heads and hearts at once, and by the simple majesty of all of his all-controlling thought, converting his hearers into 
into the express image of his own soul. The crowd was at a fever pitch and Garrison continued raising his voice. Shall such a man ever be sent back to bondage from the free soil of old Massachusetts, he mentioned towards Douglas again. No, no, no. The audience jumped to their feet and shouted. The noise poured out to, of the building and could be heard in the streets. Afterward, as the convention let out, a crowd of men and women formed around Douglas who were eager to shake his hand, thump him on the back, and compliment him on his speech. When the crowd finally dissipated, a group of Nantucket's prominent black citizens, led by Edward J. Pompey, a, a free black whaler, industrialist, and ship commander, approached Douglas, brimming with pride. The group was from Newtown, Nantucket's black district, where Douglas was lodging. They escorted him out of the church and down the road past the fence that segregated Newtown from the rest of the town. So abolitionist is a, a practice of institute, especially capital punishment or former formerly slavery. So is a a person who favors the abolition. Oh, the the abolishment of slavery. Okay, a person who favors the abolishment. Or, or the, the, the destruction, or whatever you want to call it, of slavery. Okay, a person who's against slavery, or some capital punishment, or practice, or, or of an institution. Okay, the belief that uh, that slavery should be abolished. <laughs> we got, we still, we probably, we still got some abolitionists today. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some other kind of capital punishment, or or, or the practice, or the institution. <laughs> All right. Uh, the walk from the Athenium to Newtown took 15 minutes as the group walked south, passing first the rest of the town, then a cow pasture, and finally a fence made of wood planks. Above Newtown was a set of large windmills, and to the south, a settlement of displaced Wampanoag Indians who lived in the wilderness on the island's coast. Newtown was a cluster of houses erected along a grid of 11 streets. Prominent among them was Angola Street, an allusion to the resident's African heritage. The center of the enclave was the African Meeting House, a square building with a gable roof, a gray wood siding, and a wood plank fence surrounding it. The African Meeting House was near Nantucket's black residents attending church and school, and on occasion it hosted African-American visitors such as Douglas. That night, Douglas stayed up talking with the island's black residents, who also included the wealthy black whaling captain Absalom Boston and the leading black families of the island. When morning came, Douglas left Newtown to attend the second day of the convention at the Athenium. Excitement about his speech seemed to have grown overnight, and when he entered the hall, people crowded around him, thumped, him, thumped his back, and showed him, showered him with adulation. The next day, he returned to the mainland Massachusetts where William Lloyd Garrison offered him a job as a traveling speaker for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. I doubt anyone would want to hear me speak, Douglas told Garrison. Nonetheless, he accepted the offer and began traveling the country telling his story as he had in Nantucket. In the following months, Douglas rose to fame as an abolitionist and orator. His time on the island catapulted him to prominence and also galvanized the African-American community there. Among them was a young woman who would become one of America's most powerful black entrepreneurs, Mary Ellen Pleasant. Mary Ellen, Ellen Pleasant. Everybody put that name in the comments below. Mary Ellen Pleasant. So we're going to get into the story of the first of the six African-Americans to escape slavery and become millionaires. And this woman obviously was impacted by the courage of Frederick Douglass, who started his, uh, started his, I guess his orating, uh, you know, when well, he was a preacher, but he really began started orating at this place called Nantucket. And she uh, was in attendance with him when she did this, or when he did this, okay? Uh, so again, we're gonna get start getting into the story of the first, of the six uh, African Americans who escaped slavery and became millionaires. So abolition and capitalism 
I guess we'll say this is part two. <laughs> Abolition and capitalism, part two. In 1814, in an apartment in a three-story brick building on the Stone Street near Philadelphia's dock, Mary Ellen Williams entered the world. She was born free and black. Her parents christened her Mary Ellen Williams, taking her mother's first name and her father's last name. My parents were a strange mixture. My father was native Kanaka and my mother a full-blooded Louisiana Negress, she recalled. Pleasant had her mother's brown skin and wavy hair and her father's tall stature and Polynesian features. Her father, a silk merchant named Louis Alexander Williams, was larger than life in her memory. He was a man of great intelligence. He was like most of his race, a giant. Her mother did not leave a lasting impression on her. I was named after my mother, but I really recall little else about her, Pleasant said. What's going on, Mark Anthony? There, Smith in the house. I miss Jennifer, Miss Vivian. Never heard of it. Hey, we about we're gonna learn today. <laughs> we're gonna learn today. Pleasant's time with her parents in their apartment was brief. They sent her to live on the island of Nantucket, where she was when she was seven years old to attend school. Like many free states, Pennsylvania was both anti-slavery and anti-integration. Black children, like Pleasant, were not welcome in Philadelphia schools. In most free states during the antebellum era, there were no schooling options for African-American children. In Nantucket and Cincinnati, private colored schools had been established where parents and sponsors could buy education for black children. In 1826, this is almost 200 years ago, people, 1826, Williams took Pleasant on a steamship to live with associates of his, an island family called the Husseys while she attended school on the Massachusetts Island. The Hussies, or Husseys, who were one of Nantucket's best known and most powerful families, members of their clan had controlling interests in most of the town's institutions, including the Religious Society of Friends, the formal name of the Quaker Church, and local government and industry. They owned several houses and businesses spread across the island. Williams, a traveling fabric merchant, likely knew them as business associates. If he had known the Husseins more intimately, he perhaps would have known that they had a reputation for being dishonest. An old Nantucket verse described the Husseins, the Rays and Russells Coopers are, the knowing Folgers lazy, a lion Coleman very rare, and scarce and honest Husay. When Pleasant arrived on Nantucket, she was put into the care of Mary Husay, an elderly Quaker woman who dressed in bonnets and long skirts. Call me Grandma Huse, she told Pleasant. I want to say it's Huse or Hussey. I don't know. I'm going to say Hussey now. Grandma Hussey ran a store, a store in a wood building located beneath a grassy hill by the town's pier, a stone's throw away from the Athenium. From the window, one could see available. From the window, one could see sailors and merchants working away on ships and moving about drums of oil of whale oil after williams left pleasant in the Husey's care grandma Husey decided not to send pleasant to school and instead made her work in her store my father as i off afterward learned sent money every year for my education but i was but I, as i was an unusually smart girl and quick at everything they kept me at work in the store Pleasant resented being kept out of school, but it was an early lesson about power dynamics in the, antebell in the antebellum era. I envy children who can write a good hand and spell correctly and blame the Hussies for not giving me an education, which she later said. The Hussies were rich and white, and although Pleasant was privileged to have been born free, the color of her skin and her gender still allowed her to be taken advantage of. Thus, she came to better understand the world she lived in. Either she could fight against those who had power, or she could work with them and accept the limitations that race and gender imposed upon her. She decided to do both. She decided to do both. Let me read this again. She could either fight against those who had power, or she could work with them and accept the limitations that race and gender imposed upon her. She decided to do both. 
Now, for me, brothers and sisters, this just tells me that she was pretty smart. In some instances, she would fight. In other instances, she would work together. I guess it just kind of depended on the situation at the time. So she decided to do both. I guess when it benefited her most, she would switch it up. Stay flexible. Be adaptable. Regardless of the limitations that others are trying to put on her. Question for you is, how flexible are you? Can you turn it on and turn it off? Do you always got to be hood? I don't know. Do you always have to buck the system? I don't know. Maybe we can learn something from the one of the first African-Americans to escape slavery and become a millionaire and learn how to be flexible, regardless of the situation. Everybody putting the comments on flexible. To adapt, depending on the circumstance. She ingratiated herself with the Hoosies, making herself indispensable in their store. Look at that. She became irreplaceable, indispensable, too valuable. As a girl, she foraged the woods around the store for poke, poke berries, which she would mash and strain to make a dark purple ink for Grandma Hoosie to sell. She learned to keep the books. Uh-oh, she learned how to take care of the money. She taking care of the books. She learned how to keep the books. Sweep and clean the store and sell to customers. I was always on the watch. A few people could get out of the store without buying. A few people could get out of the store without buying something for me. She was a good salesperson. Look at this. She made herself indispensable. She would keep the books. She'd take care of the money. Right. Um. Uh. She was. Uh, she sweep and clean. Keep the store clean. And she would sell to customers. And very few people would leave that store without buying something from her. That's valuable. If I got a business, that's very valuable for my business. She learned to read and write in her spare time and used her work in the store to learn about business and human behavior. So regardless of the situation, she was using her situation to do what, people? To learn. To learn. She was using this situation, although they were trying to keep her from being educated, she used life as a tool of education, and she was using her situation or taking, it's called finding a seed of greatness uh, even in adversity. She found a seed to learn business. And here it is, not just business, human behavior. She was learning how people operated, how they moved, how they reacted to certain things. What moved them? What pushed them? What caused them to buy? What caused them to uh, caused them to get upset? She was learning human behavior by what I like to call paying attention. Everybody put it down, so pay attention. Another thing that I say is study people. She was studying people, human behavior. Here's how humans operate. Here's how black folk do. Here's how white folk do. This is how they do. She was studying people. Wow. I've let, I have let books alone. I've let books alone and studied men and women a great deal. She said, you can't learn all the book knowledge and all the human nature study in a lifetime. You must slight one or the other. So she slighted books and studied capital, both human and financial. See, she used life to learn, even though a lot of books weren't available. Now, now in 2019, we got books available. And many of us choose not to. Well, hopefully, if we are sliding books, we are doing what she did, studying capital or human capital and financial capital. This is back in 1840-something. This is almost 200 years ago we're talking about, people. During her years in the Hussays on Nantucket, Pleasant nursed a resentment of racism and slavery. When she wasn't working, she would venture south of Grandma Hussey's shop through town, past the Newtown fence to enter Nantucket's free black community. The inhabitants of Newtown were made up of black whalers, escaped slaves, and domestic servants. 
They were led by the town's most prominent citizen, Absalom Boston. Absalom was a well-muscled man with a beard that stretched from his ears down his entire jaw with no mustache. He wore gold hoop earrings and his hair was coarse and pushed back into a pompadour. What the hell is that? Pompadour, somebody look that up. P-O-M-P-A-D-O-U-R, pompadour. Man, we're going to get, we're going to learn today. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was, I, somebody, one of y'all know this uh, type of hairstyle, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, I don't. His hair was pushed back into a pompadour. Maybe that's a hat. I don't know. P-O-M-P-A-D-O-U-R. We're going to get some help. We're going to get a definition going on here. Somebody look up that word for us. We can under, we can learn what the heck a pompadour is. Absalom was a black royalty in Nantucket. He was the descendant of their islands, Indian natives, and black slaves. His family was credited with having ended slavery on the island after his uncle, Prince Boston, had challenged the legality of slavery in Nantucket, sued for his freedom, and won. Absalom inherited money from his parents, who died when he was young, and used it to build one of the first structures in Newtown, a small shop in a clapperboard house where he sold fishing equipment and groceries. In 1822, he bought and captained his own whaling ship called Industry, becoming the first black man in New England to own and lead a whaling outfit. Subsequently, he used his earnings to develop Newtown by underwriting mortgages for the houses of free blacks. Along with Boston and other prominent black man Tuckers, Pleasant attended church and learned about abolition before venturing back to her employer on the white side of the fence. Wow. So listen, so she would leave work and leave her uh, her white overseers, even though she's free, and then would travel back uh, across the fence to the black side of town. So you got the white hand and you got the black hand. So she go over to the black hand and uh and uh and be around the listen, she didn't just hang see listen, you know that you know that on the other side of the fence, right? The black hand side of the fence, just like on the white side of the fence, even on the black side of the fence, there were options of who you was gonna hang out with, right? She decided to hang out with the most prominent of those in the city. Because remember, it said in the city, uh there were uh there were black whalers escaped slaves and domestic servants so just imagine right she come back to nantucket the black side of the fence or the city or whatever and she had to choose who she was gonna hang out with now she could have hung out with the with the drinkers she could have hung out at the bar she could have hung out with people that wasn't doing much but no she found a way to get around the most prominent people in the land she was hanging around a brother who had it who started his own whaling company a brother who was writing uh, mortgages for the free black slaves so they could have houses and they could mortgage and they could, you know, they mortgage mean that they had to, they've got some debt to own their house, got a mortgage to get their house. These type of people she was hanging out with when she went back to, let's just say her side of the fence, the black side. And then she went over to the other side, the white side to go to work and to learn capital, business, financial capital and human capital. Isn't this interesting? Mary Ellen Play. I'm still nobody got that definition yet. Pompadour, P O M P A D O U R. All right. Mary Pleasant. And we're into abolition and capitalism, uh, going through Black Fortunes, which is the story of the first six African Americans to escape slavery and become millionaires. Part three. All right. Part three. Three. Are we gonna finish this? I don't know. We're gonna finish this guy. Oh Lord, we might finish it. Part three. I know that's right, Darren said. Maybe you're smart person in the group. You need to. You need a new group. Dennis P. Kimbrough. Part three. While she was learning about black culture and the liberation struggle in Newtown, Pleasant bore witness to an economic transformation from the Hoosies shop by the harbor. From the shop, she could see oil refineries being built and whaling ships carrying well carcasses and barrels of blubber. The Nantucket whaling boom was just getting underway when she arrived as a girl. So there was a there was a whaling boom, kind of like an oil boom or a gold boom. There's a whaling boom. In the early 19th century, whale oil used as light, lighting and heating oil was rapidly becoming the United States' most prized commodity, second only to cotton. 
making whaling a highly profitable business. Nantucket, with its location in the Atlantic Ocean and its tradition of deep ocean fishing, was well positioned to hunt whales. As the demand for the oil increased, Nantucket's deep ocean fishing boats were refitted as whaling ships, and the town emerged as the largest producer of whale oil in the United States. Before whale oil became readily available, most of the Western world lived in darkness once the sun went down. Candles and lamps fueled by cow and sheep fat were hard to produce, burned dimly, and gave off a foul odor. Whale oil, by contrast, burned brightly and was odorless. As it became broadly available in the United States and England, whaling exploded into an $11 million a year industry, and that's about $309 million today, becoming the third largest economic sector in the United States after cotton and manufacturing. The boom made Nantucket, one of the richest and busiest towns in the world during the years Pleasant was reared there. So she had a little bit of luck on her side that she was born at that time and she was in that place. So so, so although she, she was free, but she wasn't treated like she was free, she was in the right place at the right time to learn the right stuff during an economic boom. And don't get it twisted. Uh, we're at the right time at the right place now because we are part of, an, we are privy to a part of an economic boom as well. It's just a different time. It's just a different product. It's just a different commodity. But we can do, we're in the, we're, we are at the right time in the right place. Everybody put a comment so right time, right place. So we can look at uh, Mary Ellen Pleasant, who was one of the first uh, six African-Americans who state slavery and become a millionaire. We can look at her situation and say, oh, man. But during that time, she was at the right time and the right place. Well, it was also a catalyst for social change. I guess I, I guess I can't depend on y'all for this. OK, let me go get this. Let me go get this definition because it don't seem like nobody really working with me today. So let me go ahead and find this definition. I thought that uh, I thought y'all was with me. Papa Door. I guess y'all didn't hear me. Uh, definition. All right. So Papa Door is a woman's hairstyle in which the hair is turned back off the forehead in a roll. So it's a woman's hairstyle in which the hair is turned back off the forehead in a roll. Okay, Papa Door. All right, fantastic. I right, get that out of the way. Well, it was also a catalyst for social change. With the onset of whaling in Nantucket, men abandoned work in town for high wage jobs working on dock, on docks and in open waters and whaling crews. In their absence, women became entrepreneurs and laborers, running the restaurants, the stores, the hotels in town. The whaling boom also created a black middle and upper class in Nantucket. Benefiting from racial stereotypes about their unnatural strength, black men were recruited to the island to hunt whales. Whaling offered a much better life than slave labor or tenement farming. In addition, men who worked on whaling crews were often shareholders, not employees, and were entitled to a percentage of the profits from the whales they helped bring in. As a result, black men in Nantucket could achieve moderate to high incomes that were unheard of by blacks in the slave era. As the whaling industry grew, so did the middle black middle class on the island. Pleasant watched as new, new town grew from a poor village into an enclave of black middle class families. As a result of the emergence of the whaling industry, Pleasant was raised in a boom town. She, worked, she watched as people flocked to Nantucket to work on whaling ships, to open oil refineries or hotels and saloons to cater to the growing population. Soon people made fortunes in Nantucket. Others lost them. I'm sorry, some people made fortunes, others lost them. The lessons she learned from witnessing the boom would one day prove themselves useful. So Nantucket, not only was it a new town, it was a boom town. <laughs> a boom town. So, so this space of black people on this island Although we're talking about 1800s, it was a land of opportunity. And I'll venture to say it was a land flowing with milk and honey as the whaling industry was taken off in Nantucket. And black folk had an opportunity to participate and not just be employees. Now, listen to this. This is back in 1800. 
not just be employees. They had an opportunity to be shareholders. That means that they could participate in the profits. Now, what does that say to us nowadays, guys? That some of us, we, we got jobs, that's cool. And some of us choose to just be employees. Well, I want to tell you, why don't you be like Nantucket? Why don't you at least get you some shares in the company that you work for and participate in those profits? Why just do I just settle for being an employee, punching the clock, and not having a piece of ownership in the company for which you work for? Now, we call this stock nowadays. Back then, they probably they don't know what they call it, but it's called stock nowadays. Stock options in your company is what you would call it as well. And you will notice that the wealthy people, not only do they work for companies, not only do the CEOs and the CFOs and the, all that stuff work for the company, but part of their benefit package is called stock options. Now, you, you may not necessarily be a CEO, but you probably have an option to get stock in the company for which you work for through what they call your 401k. These are the things that we must begin to learn and understand because, listen, they're talking about this stuff that they were participating in back 200 years ago, and some of us have not wised up enough to start to participate in it today. Let me read this again. The men who worked on the well and cruise were often shareholders, not employees. Everybody put on so shareholder. And were entitled, entitled to a percentage of the profits from the wells they help bring in. See, most people just kind of glaze right over that. But you know, I'm all financial. I'm like, wait a second. These brothers were raking in profits from the work that they did. So if they hauled in more wells or bigger wells or whatever the case may be, they got more profits. They participated in those profits. You and I, we might feel like we're on a plantation today. Some of y'all, some people think like that. But you and I have an easier opportunity to become a shareholder in these companies, more so than just being a um, employee. Okay, Melanie, thanks so much. I got a visual now. Morris Day and the time, his hairstyle. Okay. Oh, I'm glad somebody helped the brother out. I was like, dang, ain't nobody gonna help her brother out today. Oh, Lord. Okay, thanks so much, Melanie. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Shareholders. Now, where are we at? Are we on? Okay, so we're on Abolition and Capitalism, Chapter 1, Part what? Part 4 now? Let's just say this is Part 4. I think we just did Part 3. Part 4. Part 4. Whew. In the days following the Abolitionist Convention and Frederick Douglass' debut in 1841, Pleasant planned to make a move on her own. Not long after Douglas went back to Springfield, Massachusetts, she boarded a steamship of to, for mainland Massachusetts at the Nantucket Pier. I don't think we're going to finish. Nantucket Pier at the Nantucket Pier. I went to Boston to better my condition, she later said. Pleasant arrived in Boston around the year 1842 when she was 26 years old and got a job as an apprentice to a cobbler in a shop in Boston South End. The South End was a home to the city's money class. Men who were, wore broadcloth suits with gold watch chains hanging from their waistcoat pockets. And streets were made of gravel and cobblestones and lined with bar Baroque Victorian homes and mansions. At the shop, Pleasant learned to make boots and sew vests. Pleasant hadn't left Nantucket to escape the Hussies or to find a better job or trade. On the contrary, she remained close with the Hussies and couldn't have hoped to provide a future for herself in shoemaking or any other trade she could learn. To secure a good life, a woman was expected to get married. To better her position, she needed to find a husband, and Boston's Tony, Boston's Tony South End was a good place as any to find a well-heeled one. So listen to this. She said, okay, so I guess I need I gotta find me a husband. And uh, I'm not gonna, I, if I'm going to get married, I'm gonna go to a place where I can find the men who are well to do. So she went to the better part of town to find the better class of people. Everybody put the guys on caliber. So she was even thinking about the caliber of the man she was gonna marry. And she said, well, I'm probably not gonna find him in the rough part of town. I'm probably not going to find the caliber man that I want to marry in the poverty-stricken part of town. I'm going to go to the 
wealthy place. I'm going to find me a well-to-do man, a man that's about business, a man that's getting stuff done, a man that's making a difference, a man that's making an impact. I'm going to go to the part of town, right, where they got Victorian homes and mansions. So Boston's Tony South End was a good place as any to find a well-heeled one. Pleasant was a striking woman. She was tall and slender with skin the color of clay, long straight nose, high cheekbones, intense dark eyes, and long hair that was black and oil straight. Perhaps her best feature was her charm and her way with words. I've always noticed that when I have something to say, people listen, she remarked. They never go to sleep on me. One day, James W. Smith, a well-dressed middle-aged businessman, entered the shop where she worked to do some shopping. He caught Pleasant's eye as she was doing her work. I made sure to strike up a conversation with him before he left, she remembered. Smith didn't say much about himself, but he did say he was Cuban. Identifying as Hispanic awarded him a racial ambiguity that allowed him to better navigate the United States racial caste system. The proportions of Spanish, Taino, Indian, and African blood he possessed were simply left to the imagination, allowing him to be, avoid being classified as colored even under the strictest interpretation of the one-drop rule. Pleasant did discover a bit of information about Smith. She learned that he was an abolitionist. Pleasant had her sights locked on Smith. After that day, she met him in the shop. He was well off, and he shared her passion for racial justice. Pleasant, however, didn't make her interest in him obvious right away. She learned that, she, that he was a member of the Catholic Church near her workplace, St. Mary's Church. Pleasant had grown up attending an African Methodist Episcopal Church in Nantucket, but became Catholic to join Smith's congregation. Look what she was doing. She had her eyes on the prize and she was putting herself in position. Now, I think, I, I don't know if, I think most of y'all women know this all too well. Once you got your eyes on the prize, you know how to put yourself in position. I mean, this is a slick lady here. Mary, Mary Anna Pleasant, she put herself in position to get her man. <laughs> Woo, she wasn't playing. She said, oh, I got my eye on you, baby. Woo. One church was the same as another to me, she uh, she later said. After joining St. Mary, she became a member of the choir. The choir was positioned in the front of the church in full view of the congregation doing service. One night inside a steeple building made of rough stone on the north side of Boston, Smith finally took notice of the young woman he met in the store. <laughs> hey, Melanie, that's right, Melanie. She changed her religion. <laughs> Woo, Lord. Honey, well, honey, 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 sister, well, I, was, I used to be Episcopal. Now I'm Catholic because I found a man. <laughs> Woo, Lord. Woo, Lord. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. Where was that? Okay. St. Mary, uh, one night inside a steeple building inside of rough stone on the north side of Boston, Smith finally took notice of the young woman he met in the store and at, a, and at church. After mass was over, Smith asked the priest, Father Trainer, to introduce him to Pleasant. Pleasant was brought to him, and he offered to walk her home. As he walked her home that night under the moonlight, uh-oh, a little romantic. A, a little romantic. <laughs> Ooh, Lord. as he walked her home that night under the moonlight. To Smith, it seemed they had been brought together by Providence. He strolled with her unaware that Pleasant had set the forces that would bring them together into motion weeks before. Y'all some tricky little chicks. Okay, I see y'all, women. I know I see what you're doing. <laughs> A few days later, thoroughly charmed by Pleasant, he asked for her hand in marriage. A few days later. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Not a few weeks. A few days later. We were married inside of a month, she bragged. We were married inside of a month. She bragged. Now, y'all know I got to talk about this just for a minute. Y'all, 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 uh, wily, uh, charming. Sisters, sisters, that, that know how to put yourself in position for that man that you done eyeballed. 
And that well to do man, that man of, of caliber. You, you know how to put yourself in position. He didn't know he was being set up. <laughs> Damn, Smith said, shake your fast and watch yourself. Show me what you're working with. <laughs> Melly said, check, please. <laughs> Oh, no, she was good, wasn't she? What's going on, Marquis? She was good, wasn't she? Woo! So, uh, Mary Ellen Pleasant, the first of the six uh, African Americans who escaped slavery, become uh, become a millionaire. Uh, at this point in time in her life, she uh, she had traveled to a new city, and she knew it was time to find her man. She she looked in the best part of town, and eventually, as she was working, she was uh, what's that called, Boaz? She was looking for her Boaz. And she roof, and as she was working, she came across a man who had who who she felt was had similar was a, was a, of equally yoked, right? He 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 was an abolitionist, so they shared the same. He was a he was a he was a man of God uh, as far as spiritual was concerned. They would that was a that was a connect, and he was an abolitionist, so they had some social or some right. They they both were against racial injustice, so they had some stuff in common. And when I say in common, it wasn't just like they just like pizza together. They, you know, they had a way the type of common. Oh, we both like sausage pizza, so I guess we should get married. No, they had similar spirits and similar beliefs. And she put herself in position. Listen, ladies, she put herself in position to be noticed. She put herself. So although he he had to do the, he had to he had to take initiative to call her out. She put herself in position to be noticed. Now I'm just gonna say this because you know it's worth being said. Some of y'all, some of y'all hiding too much. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, he gonna find me on my couch somewhere. Oh, you sure think he gonna do that? You think that's gonna happen? Maybe you need to find. You need to learn from Mary Ellen Pleasant. Learn how to put yourself in position to be noticed. Okay, I'm gonna leave that at there. I'm gonna leave that right there because we are gonna get off and talk talking about stuff I ain't really planning to talk about tonight. Because we're talking about Mary Ellen Pleasant. And we might as well finish this chapter of part five. Let's go ahead and get it in. Let's go and finish this part five of chapter one of Black Fortunes, right? The, the story of the first six African Americans to escape slavery and become millionaires. Part five. As newlyweds, Mr. James W. Smith and Miss Mary Ellen Smith split time between his home in Boston and Smith's plantation in Charlestown, West Virginia. In Boston, Mary Ellen and Jane Smith entertained abolitionists together like William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Geo Green, and Lewis Hayden. In Charlestown, they spent time at Smith's Mansion. The town was made up of Victorian homes and plantations built into the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, looking down on the Shenandoah River. It was picturesque, canopied by maple, cherry, pine, sycamore, and fruit trees, and surrounded by green hills. In its estates spanned hundreds of acres with two and three story homes made of stone, barns, and servants' quarters, tanneries, orchards, and acres of crop fields. Smith's land was managed by a young African American man named John James Pleasance. There weren't many slaves in Charlestown, only a few hundred domestic servants and enslaved black miners. Salt mining drove West Virginia's economy rather than slave dependent crops such as cotton. Charlestown did, however, have frequent slave auctions. The spectacles took place on the steps of the Jefferson County Courthouse in a town square and were well attended by slave traders from Virginia, which was just over the state line. The courthouse was two stories high and topped with a gable roof and clock tower. Out front, it had a portico, white pillars and stone steps. Men and women in chains and metal collars was marched out in front and sold to the highest bidder. Smith frequently attended slave auctions, rubbing shoulders with flesh traders in hats and long coats, smoking hand-rolled cigars as they bid on men, women, and children. Smith endured the slave markets to purchase people and set them free. My husband frequently demonstrated his feeling for the colored race by purchasing slaves and giving them their liberty, Pleasant recall. Pleasant's marriage to Smith was short-lived. Smith took ill less than two years after they were married in 1844. On his deathbed, he summoned his bride to his side. Promise me, he said to his wife. 
Promise me you will devote a portion of the money I leave you to the cause of freeing the slaves. He begged. I promise with a full heart, she told him. Smith died shortly after, leaving his entire estate to Pleasant. Leaving his entire estate to Pleasant. Smith's death left Pleasant in a familiar place. She was on her own again. In her grief, she grew closer to her late husband's land manager, John James Pleasants, or as she called him, JJ, in who she's back in Nantucket. Pleasant returned to Nantucket after her husband's funeral. There, Captain Edward Gardner, a friend of the Hoosies, who had known her as a girl in Nantucket, helped her manage her husband's estate, selling off his various properties and, estate and assets and dealing, the, dealing with paperwork. In 1846, as Pleasant was still mourning James, the island of Nantucket was struck by tragedy. The Great Fire of 1846, as it would be later called, almost burned down the entire town. The blaze started in a, in a hat shop near Grandma Hoosie's shop and spread to the docks where barrels of well oil were stored. The oil fed the blaze as it spread over the homes and businesses on the island. The fire melted the barrels of oil on the docks, spilling their flaming contents out into the ocean. The ocean seemed to turn to fire and made the night sky glow. When the blaze was extinguished seven hours later, it was nearly dawn. As the sun rose, people walked the streets in disbelief. More than one third of the town's homes and businesses were have been burned down, leaving more than 800 people homeless and even more without a way to make a living. The Nantucket Athenaeum, where Frederick Douglass had spoken and risen to fame a few years earlier, had, was burned and nearly destroyed in the disaster. After the fire, Nantucket declined as the center of the welling industry and jobs, citizens, and capital fled Massachusetts leaving those who remained to figure out how to rebuild. Shortly after the fire, Captain Edward Garner finished selling Pleasant's estate and gave her her proceeds, which amounted to $45,000, or in today's term, about $1.2 In 1848, Pleasant married J.J. in a small ceremony in West Virginia. Late in 1848, gold was discovered in California. Men from all over the country and the world left wives and jobs and families behind to try to become rich in the California gold rush. President James K. Polk evangelized for men to set out for San Francisco in his State of the Union address in December of 1848, which was reprinted in Nantucket and Boston papers. The accounts of the abundance of gold in that territory, California, are of such an extraordinary character of our are of such an extraordinary character as would scarcely command belief were they not corroborated by the authentic reports of officers in the public service who had visited the Mineral District and derived the facts which they detailed from personal observation. He said in his national address, he added later that labor commands a more exorbitant price and all other pursuits, but that of searching for the precious metals are abandoned. Nearly the whole of the male population of the country have gone to the gold districts. After Polk's address, men began to leave Nantucket for California. Whaling schooners were converted into transport ships to take them there. By 1849, more than 500 men from Nantucket had left the island for California. Among them were Pleasant's new husband, J.J., and several members of the Hoosie clan. Deserted on Nantucket by J.J. and much of her surrogate family, Pleasant made up her mind that she would go to California too. She had connections there and now possessed a small fortune as a result of her inheritance from her first husband. She had a chance at thriving there just as the male 49ers were doing. Besides, she felt she needed to keep an eye on JJ. So it looks like she is on her way to, I don't know. So anyway, she's on her way to California or she went to California. That's where it ends on chapter on chapter one. So we're gonna leave it at that. But, uh, but I do notice it though. This woman was pretty dang on smart. She said, man, I'm going to this new land. I got to find me a husband. I'm going to find me a husband that's well-to-do, so I'm going to the well-to-do part of town. I'm going to find me a job, get me a job, and then when I come across that man, I'm going to put myself in position to be noticed. She got noticed. She found her Boaz. Boaz married her. And uh, and then, unfortunately, he passed away, and uh, it seemed to be a, you know, a, 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 a well, you know, well established marriage i guess you could say but because of that because of her putting herself in position because of her 
smart or her her her, her intellect. When he passed away, she, she married the kind of man that had money. And he was able to leave an inheritance to her. And now she is managing over one point million one point two million dollars uh after the fire in Nantucket, and they're on their way to California when she married the manager of the land, which was JJ. And that's where it is in chapter one, guys. So that's where we're gonna stop here on the New Black Wall Street Book Club. What do you guys think of chapter one of Black Fortunes, um, the story of the first six African-Americans to escape slavery and become millionaires. Chapter one, abolitionism and capitalism. This is the New Black Wall Street Book Club, where black folk do read. If you put it in a book, like Daily Motivations for African-American Success, if you put it in a book, like Black Fortunes, story of the first six African-Americans who escaped slavery and became billion millionaires. We absolutely will find it. I'm your host, ERGJ. He's CEO of ERGJ Black Bazaar. And uh, we invite you not only to pick up the book, The Black Billionaires Club, but we invite you to join the club as well. Check out the website, www.theblackbillionairesclub.com and uh, click on the tab, uh, join the club. There you'll find more information about the three different levels that we have for you to get connected with brothers and sisters who are in the well-to-do part of town. We just read about Miss Mary Ellen Pleasant and how she made a decision to associate in the places where the well-to-do people associated. And that should tell us something, that we can make decisions as well to put ourselves in position. Everybody put in the comments, well, put myself in position. To put yourself in position to get around people who are making a difference, who are doing something. Versus hang around people who are doing absolutely nothing. That's a choice that you and I can make today. And we believe, as Mr. Darren Smith said earlier today, that uh, there's a quote that says that, hey, if you are the smartest person in the room, it's time to find a new room. We believe we created that new room called the Black Billionaires Club. So check out the website, theblackbillionairesclub.com, read the information, and then make a decision that could change your financial life forever. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, ERGJ Black Bazaar, the Afrocentric Marketplace. That specializes in Afrocentric home decor, personal care products, and also black art inspired gifts. Once you go check out the website, www.erjjblackbazaar.com, and check out the black art inspired mini messenger bags that are available now. They have over 70 or 50 some odd designs that you can choose from, and you pick you up one of these nice little things here called a mini messenger bag. They got black packs, things like that as well. Well, my beautiful people, I want to say, oh, we got somebody. So, so if you say, I love this book, right? Uh, Darren said, man, we do read and learn. A membership has its privileges. But if I almost said, put myself in position. That's right. Put yourself in position. Well, my beautiful people, I want to say thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. And I want you to remember this, that it takes a village. And it starts with us. Let's build as we climb together. We all we got, people. Matter of fact, we all we need. And thank God that's more than enough. Until next episode, you know what time it is. Mr. DJ, hit the music. New, new, new black, new. It's the new black Wall Street book club. Wall Street. With your host, Evan Jefferson. Evan Jefferson. It's time for us to go. Yeah. Now you ain't got to leave the computer. But we encourage you to get out there and learn and apply all the things you learn at the new Black Wall Street book club. Book club. Yeah. New Black Wall Street. The new Black Wall Street.